Well, good morning, C2 Church and C2 Church Online. It's so good to have you all with us, uh, whether you are right here in the room, which is eerily like one-sided right now. Um, I don't know like what happened to those seats over there, but if you're joining us online, all of our family is on this side. So if I'm constantly looking over here, you know why. No, I'm kidding. You guys are here too. It's good to have you. Uh, with us this morning. Uh, my name is Ben Miners. I get to serve as our youth ministries pastor here at C2 Church. And uh, we've got a great group of young people and students uh, that we meet every night on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. right here uh, throughout the summer. Uh, I'm just going to plug it because it's that important. Uh, if you have students or you are a student or you have um, friends who are in 6th to 12th grade, um, you should come hang out with us. Uh, we love Jesus and we love talking about him and um, growing more like him together. Uh, but so good to have you with us. Thanks for joining us again. Um, Pastor Jeremy and Darcy um, send their greetings. They're actually on uh, a vacation to visit some family in Florida, and so they're enjoying the um, hot weather, I imagine. I don't know if it's as hot there as it is here. Uh, man, it's like, I'm sorry, Pastor Jeremy and Darcy. Um, <laughs> But um, hopefully they're, they're getting some rest and getting to hang out with the family. And so they send their love and their greetings. They wanted me to give you all a virtual hug, um, all of you online as well. So they love you. And um, that was what he had asked me to relate to you. Um, he did not ask me to say what I'm going to say next. And um, I've had the privilege to um, be youth pastored by Jeremy. I, when I was in high school, he was my youth pastor. And um, since then, I've had the privilege of serving on this team with him for the past eight years. And um, I want to take a moment. I believe it's important that we um, give honor where honor is due, that we honor people who have made an immense impact in our lives and the life of our community. And so I just want to take a moment and um, say how grateful I am for the leader that Jeremy Reisner and his wife is um, and for the way that he has led. I've seen him lead through some really difficult moments in our church over the years, um, some really hard moments. And there's been in moments of weakness and tired and weariness. Um, and I'm so grateful that we have a, a lead pastor who um, knows how to wait on the Lord, that leads with prayer and humility, um, who listens. And um, I'm so grateful for his um, leadership of our church and of me as a person. Um, and so can we take a moment while they're on vacation and while they're resting and, and spending some time with their extended family, can we pray over them and can we just bless them that this time would be, um, that God would use it to re replenish and energize and um, they would have a beautiful time together as a family on the beach somewhere and doing that. Can we pray together and can we ask God to honor them? Father, we thank you so much for the leaders that we have in our lives, God. And I know that um, you use all things and all people, but God, I'm so grateful for um, Jeremy and Darcy and their family, God. Uh, I'm so grateful for the way that they have invested in my life and, um, and even the investment that I'm able to give or that I'm able to share with the people that I love and care about. Um, God, I know that it comes through you, but it come, came through them. And so, Father, this morning, I just pray your blessing over them. I ask that you would um, walk with them, that they would, even while they're on vacation, God, that they would experience your nearness and your presence, Jesus, that they would... Um, feel you shattering their shadowing their steps god i ask that, that as they're spending time with family that you would be in their midst and that you would um, give them peace that goes beyond understanding and joy you would set it before them father i pray for their children for maddie and caitlin and robbie god i ask that you would um, give them a greater awareness of your presence and your spirit father that you would fill them with your joy and your peace even while they spend time together with the family um, god i'm so grateful for them we just ask your blessing over them provide for their every need and uh, we bless them in Jesus' name. And the church said, amen, amen. Hey, um, so just to kind of go ahead, and, we're in, in this series called Life Hacks, and we're going to get to what we're going to talk about here in a moment. But um, like I said, my name is Ben Miners, and um, I have some like new stuff happening in my life uh, that I just wanted to share briefly with you. Um, my wife, um, beautiful Salvadoran lady who is not here right now, um, and so I, I'm going to like talk about her, um, and she's probably going to give me dirty looks from the live stream. So I'm not going to look online, um, but um, she is uh, she's an amazing person, and we are expecting our first child. Um, and yeah, I I am right there with you. So excited! She's six months along, and we cannot be more stoked. We don't know. Everyone's asking what gender is it. I don't know. Um, we will find out soon, I think. Um, but I just kind of told her, I was like, "That's feel free to do what you want with that. Um, I'm good either way. We have a human coming into the world, and that scares me enough." <laughs> you know. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so we like, we, 
we were so stoked. I actually, I think I knew before she did that she was pregnant because she hates mustard. Um, hates it, hates it, hates it. Never has liked it. She's a ketchup and mayo person the whole way. And, um, and one day, um, I'm, we're here at the, in the office and she's in the kitchen preparing some Asian like Thai noodles that she made. She made some like pad Thai noodles. She made, it was beautiful, amazing noodles. And she, as she's getting this bowl, she reaches into the fridge and pulls out this mega thing of mustard and just starts squirting it all over the top of her noodles. And I like immediately kind of had a panic attack because I'm like, you don't do things you don't like, you know, like <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty easy going when it comes to food, but if you don't like something, you don't like something. <laughs> and I'm like, baby, what are you doing? And she looks at me with this like kind of helpless face. She just goes, I don't know. I just really feel like mustard. <laughs> and I was like, you're pregnant. <laughs> it was the most amazing thing. Uh, and sure enough, she's pregnant. And um, that was why she's never touched mustard again since that moment. Um, incredible, right? Like I, so I wonder, uh, it's just, it's just so crazy to me. This whole process is just so different and weird and amazing, beautiful. Um, like everything changes, doesn't it? I mean, it's like everything in your house, in your life. Um, and I say like, like we, because it's like, she is the one who's pregnant, but I almost feel like in some way, like my life is drastically affected as well. And it should be. Um, it's like a complete reprioritization of the things I think about, of the things I do, the things I prepare, the way that we, and much so more so for her than even for me. But um, it's just this crazy moment of like everything changes. It's so wild. And um, I wonder, like, it's, it's, I was just thinking about how um, sometimes the way that I, my life changes in, re, in regards to like a baby and all the preparation, you know, I'm thinking about like, I'm thinking about things I've never really thought about before, like the chemicals in the air and the chemicals in my food, you know, and like asking questions about every single thing. Like, is this good for the baby? Is this good for the baby? Like, and um, I've never had these questions, these filters that I had to run things through. Um, I'm like, I'm food preparation is much more of a big deal for me now than it ever was because like we love foods. We used to hate, we hate foods. We used to love, you know, after the third, fourth try of making something for dinner, it's like that finally worked. You know, <laughs> great. Now I've got to eat all this, <laughs> you know, and it's just this very different. And, and I kind of, it, it would be really weird. And let's be honest, it would be really strange if the pregnancy test wasn't positive and I started doing all of those things, wouldn't it? Now, if you just can imagine with me for a second, if she wasn't actually pregnant, and I started doing all of those things, if, you know, I'm like spending hours pouring through like what to expect when you're expecting, you know, the Bible of like pregnancy. And it, it would be weird for me to like be reading that and to be downloading that. I'm not sure what it's called, but it's like that baby equals fruit app um, that, you know, what I'm talking about like where like it tells you at every single week and every stage, like how big your baby is. And it uses fruit the whole way through to describe how big. So it's like they've like gamified baby growth is what they've done. And you get like a special badge every week for like you reach like your baby is now the size of a cherry. Like <laughs> your baby is now the size of a peach. <laughs> your baby is like, wow, we made it. And so you're like, you're an avocado. You're now an eggplant. You're now, you know. <laughs> And it's funny, it, my wife probably didn't think it was very funny when she wanted to go to the baby section at the store, and, and like I walked her over to the produce aisle, and I was like, here we are. <laughs> no, I didn't, I didn't actually do that. I didn't. She would not have thought that was funny, and I didn't do it, but I definitely had the thought. <laughs> I was like, there's the orange and the eggplant and the avocado. That's our baby. Um, but it would be really weird for me to do all of those things if she wasn't actually pregnant. And the life hack that we're going to jump into today, I think we kind of, our culture kind of sees this life hack that way. We're talking about fasting. And many of us, when we say the word fasting, we probably wouldn't categorize fasting as a life hack. You know, maybe as a buzzkill, but not a life hack, right? Like our culture, we even within the church, I would say, we don't actually think of fasting as not and not eating food, keeping ourselves from food, we don't actually think of that as something that makes our life easier or that enriches our life. And many in our culture, I would say in American Western culture, perhaps, would look at someone who is fasting almost as like this arbitrary, like, why are you doing that? Like, what is the purpose? What is the end goal of you like 
eating food or like not eating food. And, and when like there's so much food around, like the only reason you really shouldn't eat food is if you like don't have any money, right? And even then there's always ramen noodles, right? It doesn't really make sense. And, and we kind of have this, like this, this aversion to it. And, and even within the church, I think we're so unfamiliar with it. And it's actually this like ancient practice. And we in the Western world, the Western culture, I would say even specifically like in North America, perhaps, or in the Western European, I don't know, like we're like one of the only religious groups or, or communities where fasting is actually not a normal and regular part of our life. In fact, throughout all of history, much of history and many of the world religions, fasting is actually a very normal spiritual discipline. And so we actually find ourselves in the minority, even, I would say, in the last couple hundred years within Christianity, and specifically Western Christianity, fasting has become something that we don't actually do, that we don't actually know much about. Which I believe is tragic because I think that hunger actually humbles us so that food can teach us. I think hunger humbles us so that food can teach us. And I think it's important, even though fasting, and we can acknowledge fasting is a, a wide practice that crosses cultures and religions and belief systems. But what's unique about biblical fasting, I believe, is actually what it means to the story of the world and the story of Scripture. And actually, it's even rooted beyond just what abstaining from food, but it is actually rooted in what food and drink mean and the story of history and humanity and what it means to us as it relates to Scripture. And so I think that's a great place for us to start, would be to look to the Scriptures and to discover what is it that even food and drink, what do these things mean? What is the purpose? Are they an end in themselves, or do they mean something else? And that will actually dictate to us how we interact with food and drink, and whether we fast or whether we feast. And I actually believe that a conversation about fasting alone is probably incomplete. I think we probably need to look at the disciplines of fasting and also the disciplines of feasting together. And so that's what we're going to do this morning. Is that all right? Can we do that? Awesome. Let's jump in. We're going to go to, we're going to start today in Luke. We're going to do a lot of jumping around. And I brought a whiteboard up here because I, it helps me to visualize things when I'm jumping around. I apologize if we move quickly. I'm going to try to get everything in so you can get home, so you can go home and fast for lunch. I mean, eat your lunch. Um, we're going to go, if you want to go with me, if you brought your Bible, you can turn it on. Or if, um, if you're joining us online, there's this really cool, if you're on, if you're at our online campus portal, C2 Church, um, C2 Church Como dot online dot church, I think is the address. Um, there's actually a Bible app like feature in that thing. If you ever want to check that out, really cool. You can follow along in scriptures there as well. Um, but we're going to go to Luke chapter four. In Luke chapter four, we find Jesus and he is beginning his public ministry here on the earth. And he, um, he has this, this, this radical moment where he is, um, he, he kind of has, has called a few disciples around him, but he comes to this moment where he, it's like his public ministry, his call, his identity is placed on the very edge of the wilderness, this river called the Jordan River. And his cousin is actually this kind of crazy guy who um, lives out in the desert. And he actually, fasting was a very common um, ritual and form of, of discipline for him and his community. Many scholars believe that John probably was trained among the Essenes, who were a, uh, a group of, a, like a denomination, so to speak, of the Jewish faith, who had separated themselves from the greater culture, had moved out into the desert to kind of become, to be alone with God, so to speak and to know him more intimately. And they believe that, that the way that most of the Jewish faith was living was actually wrong and kind of married to the world and like they were becoming like the world. And so they said, hey, we're going to remove ourselves. We're going to adopt vows of poverty and we're going to um, adopt this rigid lifestyle of fasting and of abstaining from food in order to draw closer to God and become more like him. And so many scholars believe that John was probably, he, we know that he um, stayed in the desert. He was probably a part of a community like this. And the Holy Spirit moves on him and begin, he begins um, preparing the way for the chosen one, the Messiah, the one who's going to come in and liberate Israel from oppression and slavery to what, what many of the people thought was to Rome, the occupying country. But Jesus would soon show that he was about something much deeper and much more important. But Jesus comes to this river, Jordan River, where John is baptizing people and calling people to repent because the kingdom of heaven is near. And so he's baptizing people, and Jesus comes to his cousin John, who, again, he's taking vows of poverty, he's eating, like, 
weird things when he does eat. He's not eating a lot of the time. He's fasting. He's spending a lot of time in prayer. He's taking vows of poverty, perhaps. So he's actually, his clothes are not just like normal clothes. He didn't just go to, you know, uh, Marshall's and get his wardrobe. He, he's actually made his wardrobe for what he could find in the wilderness. So he's wearing camel hair and he's just this weird character, right? And Jesus comes to him and, and, and is baptized in this moment. And at first, John doesn't even get it. He's like, why are you coming to me? You're the chosen one. Why are you coming to me? But Jesus says, listen, we're going to do this to fulfill all righteousness. And so John baptizes him in this moment. In this moment when Jesus is baptized, there's this crazy moment where like the heavens open and they see the spirit of God. It's really cool. If you want to check out Luke chapter three and four, like you should read it. Um, but the spirit comes out and his voice comes from heaven and says, this is my son in whom I am very well pleased and so this, it's this like speaking to Jesus' identity and his call and his purpose. But immediately after that moment, and if you read it in the, account in the Gospel of Mark, it says like immediately the Spirit drove him or pushed him. He was moved by the Holy Spirit to go into the wilderness. So he leaves, he's on the edge of the wilderness at this river. He goes into the wilderness and he begins to fast. And it says he fasts for 40 days. And again, the ancient understanding, biblical understanding of fasting is that you stop eating. I know for... Some of us maybe in the room who are familiar with fasting in modern Western Christianity, we fast all kinds of things. We fast sugar. We fast, you know, we do a Daniel fast. And like we, you know, we fast meat. We fast um, toys. We fa- I don't know. Like we just, we, we kind of use the word fasting and everything. But in the ancient times, those things did not exist. When you were fasting, you were simply not eating. And so it says that Jesus is actually in the wilderness fasting for 40 days and it says he was hungry. No kidding, right? <laughs> And it's in this moment that we come to, in chapter 4, we come to this place where it says he's in the wilderness and the devil comes to tempt him. And the devil says to him and says, if you really are the son of God, which was just what was spoken over him before, he says, if you really are the son of God, then tell this stone to become bread. And Jesus responds by quoting a passage from Deuteronomy that was well known by the people. And it was, it was a passage from Deuteronomy that's really important. I want us to read it together because he says this. Jesus says these words. He says, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So he's like, there's no rule, right, that you can't turn a stone into bread, right? Like it would make sense if you're really the son of God and you have this supernatural power that you would do some kind of a miracle and show that you are who you say you are. And Jesus said, don't distract me from my purpose, My fasting has a purpose. And he quotes this passage as the purpose for why he's fasting. I think it's important that we look at this passage. It's in Deuteronomy that Jesus quotes. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3, if you want to flip over there real fast. And this is um, Moses relating the words of God to the people of Israel after they've come through the wilderness. And he's, uh, this is kind of the terms of their covenant. And he's recounting their story about how they had walked through the wilderness for 40 years because of their unfaithfulness and they were not listening to God. And so they walked through the wilderness for 40 years and God brought them through these series of events. And it says this, it says that he humbled you in the, in the wilderness um, so to test you so that he would know what's in your heart. And he says this, he humbled you, talking to the people of Israel, he humbled you by letting you go hungry. Then he gave you manna to eat, which manna was this, if you know the story of the Israelites walking through the wilderness in those 40 years, they didn't have any food out in the desert. And so this bread from, literally came from heaven. It like floated down and almost like appeared on the ground, almost like a condensation. It was like a wafer of some sort. And they didn't know what it was. And so they called it, they, the, the Hebrew term was like, what is it? <laughs> and so it's called manna. And so they call this bread manna. So that's what he's saying here. He says, then he gave you manna to eat, which you and your fathers had not known. And get this, so that you might learn that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. I believe that hunger can humble us so that food can teach us. Now I know that obviously in this passage, it's not food that's actually doing the teaching, it's the Lord, food is the instrument. But he said, he humbled you by letting you go hungry so that you might learn. Then he gave you food so that you might learn that man doesn't live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. I see here in this story and in this passage that the purpose of fasting is actually not um, a diet thing. It's not a health thing, which intermittent fasting has kind of become a, a pop term in our culture. It has these health benefits. It's awesome. It's great. Um, 
that might be true, but that's not actually what this is about. And Jesus says here that actually abstaining from food is actually about learning to be humble. It's about humbling myself. Jesus was in a process for 40 days of, and this is, this is one of the more extreme fasts in scripture, so I'm not like saying you should go out and fast, stop eating for 40 days. You, at 40 days, you are on the verge of actual starvation. Many of us think that if we go without a meal for a day and a half, then like we are on the verge of starvation. Not true, actually. Your body can go for a good 20 to 30 to 40 days without any food, and you'll be fine until about that 30, 40 days, and that's when you start actually starving. And so Jesus does this extreme fast, only done by three, two other prophets in all of Jewish history. But it's this important moment. And I think if we look at fasting from a biblical standpoint, I think we need to look at it from there. Because sometimes there's some misconceptions about fasting that we carry, not just from our culture, but also from our spiritual kind of heritage and religion. Some similar issues that the Jewish people had when it came to fasting. Some of these things, I think sometimes when we think of fasting, at least in, in my background and growing up, fasting kind of was like this way for me to declare to God that I was like serious. Like I fast when something, like when I really need to hear from God on something, I really want him to do something for me in my life. I need a miracle. And so I'm going to like fast and pray. And what that does is it shows God, hey, I'm really serious about this. And God's impressed with my devotion and my, my, my fasting, my discipline. And so he responds by doing the thing I've asked him to do. But if you look at the history, and if you look at every moment in the Bible where fasting is recorded, that's actually the only type of moment in Scripture where fasting is actually condemned, <laughs> is that attitude right there. Most of the time in Scripture, the vast majority of moments that fasting is recorded and talked about in Scripture, the vast majority of fasts are actually a response to a few different things. It's a response to God. And it's actually, fasting is really, it's humbling ourselves, fasting humbles us so that we can hear and obey. Dr. Tim Mackey kind of catalogs three reasons. If you look at all the examples of fasting in scripture, and you can kind of put them into more or less three different buckets. One, it would be um, like f coming to a personal crossroads, a new beginning, something is changing in your life and in God's plan for you, and so you're going into a fast. You could probably even put Jesus' fast in this category of there's a, something new that God's doing, and so I am going to stop and prepare, right? My wife is pregnant. We're going to stop. We're going to rearrange and reprioritize everything in our life and prepare for what's coming next. There's also a moment where, where, where there's repentance or turning from sin, and it's saying, this, God has shown me that this attitude, this habit, this thing in my life is not actually helpful, but it's hurtful. And I need to let go of it. I need to remove it from my life. And so I'm going to stop everything I do and focus on turning to God. And fasting is a, is a, um, is a suitable way. It's a good way to respond to God in that way. It's not paying for my sin. It's not me hurting myself and showing that I'm so sorry. It's actually about me responding to God again. And then the final one would be um, conflict or tragedy. And for many of us, I think our culture teaches us to deal with conflict and tragedy in some really like harmful ways. <laughs> but in Scripture, actually, what we see throughout the majority of Scripture, especially when there's personal conflict or communal conflict and tragedy, the response by, and the, the biblical response is actually to stop eating and to humble ourselves so that we can hear God's voice and we can obey him. And many of us, when it comes to conflict, our first knee-jerk reaction is really not to stop eating. In our culture, it's really to kind of like grab our closest best friends and be like, hey, listen, um, man, I don't know if you know this person, but this other day, this person came and did this to me. Have they ever done that to you? Is that, is that normal? Is that, man, I don't know. They did this to me. I don't know if I can trust them now. And what do you think? What do you think? And, and, and we, we call it processing or venting, don't we? dealing with personal conflict. And, and it's funny that we use the term venting because venting, if you think about the actual like mechanics of it, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's like when there's a superheated thing going on and you vent in order to get that super hotness to leave. And so like we've got something going on, on the inside of us that's burning us up. Venting actually like allows that heat to leave. But the way that we vent most oftentimes is actually we sit down in front of someone else and we vent in their face. <laughs> and if we think about it, we're like, I don't want this heat in me, so I'm going to throw it onto you. And then we wonder, man, why is my relational universe so heated? Why is there so much drama? 
Maybe because I've been venting. And maybe venting is not actually the right way to deal with conflict or tragedy or anger in my life. And fasting has a way of clarifying our inner world. It has a way of pulling out the drama because it pulls out the selfishness in me. It actually forces me to humble myself and to not be wise in my own eyes, even if I'm right or if I'm wrong. When I fast, I become low in my own eyes. It's actually an act of me saying to God, I'm saying to God, like, God, I really feel hungry. Did you hear that? That was wild. All right. God, I really feel hungry. And I need something. I ha- what I, my need is a temporary need. I know I don't maybe really exactly need food in this moment, but I'm so hungry. But God, I'm going to say no to that hunger because what I really want is to be hungry for you. Because I know, just like Jesus said, that I don't just live on food alone. The food and drink is not the end all of my life. The point of my life is not to eat well. That's not the purpose. If that's my only purpose, then I'm going to go ahead and live out the American dream. And then as soon as food and drink are over, my life purpose and everything is over. But God, I know in this moment, I'm going to say no to food. I don't want food. What I want is you. And so I'm going to say yes, yes, yes to the word, to you. Every word that comes from your mouth, I want to hear. And so I'm putting myself in a low position of not eating, saying no to something I temporarily need to connect and heighten my awareness of what I really need, of what I ultimately need, of what I cannot do without. I can go without food for a long time, but according to scripture, this whole planet, this whole world, this whole existence cannot go for one millisecond without the word of God sustaining it. That's what we believe. The scriptures say in Psalms that he sustains everything by the word of his mouth. And so when Jesus says that man doesn't live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God, he's saying, listen, food isn't actually what I need. And so when I fast, I'm actually humbling myself. I'm becoming still. I'm listening. And I'm saying, your word is what I need. I don't need to be right in this personal conflict that I have. My need is actually not to be right, even though it feels just like it feels like I need food. It feels like I need to be right. It feels like I need to be justified. But God, actually, I'm realizing as I sit here and I stop eating, I don't need food and I don't need to be right. All I need is you. You're the only thing I need. And If I have you, whether I'm right or whether I'm wrong, I'm good. And fasting is the declaration of that. When we fast and when we pause and we push those things out, we become aware of it. And when we're humbled, we can hear, and we can obey, we can respond. That's what fasting's about. And so we can move from fasting, and then Jesus says in, in Luke chapter 4, it's really amazing. In Luke chapter 4, um, he moves on. We're just going to kind of like move through Luke pretty quickly here, okay? Is that cool? Because he doesn't just fast. He fasts for 40 days, he comes out of the desert, and he moves on. And in, in Luke chapter 5, um, in verse 27, he, he, as his ministry continues, he goes and he finds this tax collector who is actually a really bad guy. Best case scenario, um, he's a corrupt city official. Worst case scenario, he's actually like a part of the mafia. And like that's the kind of, I'm just giving like context for like what this kind of a person is. And he calls me, he says, you come follow me. Leave everything, the person you were, come follow me. And Levi does. And they throw this big banquet and they have a feast. And it really kind of like gets the, the feathers of the religious people really like riled up because they see him sitting down with this corrupt city official mafia member and all his friends and they're eating and feasting and celebrating and they're like, why are you doing this with these people? And then beyond that, Jesus actually kind of makes a habit of doing this in this religious culture in place. He begins kind of a habit of doing these feasts on these specific days where they're supposed to be fasting as a religion. <laughs> There's kind of this understood thing that, you know, like on Wednesdays and Fridays that we fast because we want to be close to God and we want to be religious and like that's what good people do. And so we fast and Jesus begins like actually like doing the opposite on these fasting days. He starts feasting and having these banquets where they're celebrating people turning to him and saying yes to him and yes to God's change in their life. 
And so, so, so in this moment, they, like the, the, the leaders, the religious rulers challenged him and they said, like, why are you eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners? And he's like, listen, it's not the doctor, or it's not the healthy who need a doctor, it's actually the sick. And then they go, but then why are you not fasting? Because even your cousin John's disciples, they even fast and say prayers at certain times of the day, and, but your disciples don't fast with us. And Jesus says these words. He says, you can't make the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them, can you? But the time will come when the groom will be taken away from them. Then they will fast in those days. And Jesus was saying to his culture that trusted in their religion and their ability to fast and be disciplined. He was saying, listen, there's a time to fast, but it's not right now. You don't, you don't go to a wedding when they're celebrating this union of two people. You don't go to a wedding and, and, and sit back at the banquet and go, oh, I'm not going to eat. I'm not going to participate. Why? Well, because I'm spiritual. Because I'm trying to, I'm trying to grow as a person. No, you go and you celebrate because the whole point of being there at the wedding, that was the point. All of the waiting, the, the dating and the engagement and all of that was this time of waiting and looking forward to this moment when the two would become one. And Jesus is saying, that, listen, all of history has been pointing to the moment when heaven and earth would become one again. And it is wrong for you to sit at the dinner table when the bridegroom has come and has brought the kingdom. It's wrong for you to sit there and be all spiritual and not actually experience the joy and the peace that comes from the kingdom of heaven coming to the earth. And so just as important as fasting is as a discipline, it's also vitally important that we learn the discipline of feasting. In our culture, I think we don't fast, and so we also don't actually feast. We fill ourselves with food all the time, but we're not really feasting in the way that the biblical understanding of feasting and eating and what food and drink are supposed to mean. We're good at filling ourselves, but we don't fast, and so we don't actually feast either. And I believe that fasting is actually vital to feasting. Jesus goes on, and he says in, in Luke 7, um, man, he says in Luke chapter 7, there's so much, so much I want to cover, and we don't have a lot of time, so here's what we're going to do. Um, fasting, we said it's about humbling Surrendering ourselves so we hear and obey. Feasting, on the flip side, is declaring. Feasting declares the unity and the joy of God's kingdom, of his family. Whereas fasting is like a waiting in a response. Feasting is the declaration. And so feasting, really, in a sense, is actually, you can think of it this way. Feasting is a foretaste of what fasting longs for. I'll say that again. Feasting is a foretaste of that which fasting is longing for. We can think of it maybe in, in these terms, that perhaps fasting grows a hunger in us for God's kingdom. I'm identifying, I'm becoming awareness, I'm, I'm becoming hungry. Feasting gives us a glimpse of God's kingdom. This is the thing we're waiting for. In Luke chapter 7, Jesus comments to his religious culture, the people around him, and he makes this statement about his culture. He says, to then what should I compare these people of this generation, and what are they like? They're like children sitting in the marketplace calling to each other. We played the flute for you, but you didn't dance. We sang a lament for you, and you didn't weep. He's like, this is what this people in this generation are like. It's like children in the marketplace calling to each other, and you know how children are, Right? One, one group says to the other, hey, we played the flute, we played some happy music, and you're not dancing. And the other group calls back, well, we were playing a sad song, and you didn't cry with us. And he says, that's totally like the people of this generation in this moment in time. And it seems so familiar to me today that we spend all our time trying to show our opinions and, and trying to like, hey, you're supposed to do this, you're supposed to do this. And Jesus says these words, he says, for John the Baptist, my cousin, weird, funny John, didn't come eating and drinking. He came fasting. He came very different. And you said, he has a demon. He's weird. There's something wrong with that guy. But he says, the son of man, referring to himself, has come eating and drinking, celebrating and feasting and declaring the kingdom of God is here. And you call him a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. And then he makes this really interesting, really funny like statement about wisdom. 
He says, yet wisdom is vindicated by her children. Or maybe your translation there says deeds. And we don't have a ton of time to get into this, but I'm just going to draw this up here really quick. Is that all right? This last phrase kind of perplexed me. I didn't really always understand it. And, and I may not still understand it, but I think I'm getting there. He says, yet wisdom is vindicated by all her children. I apologize for my handwriting. Or deeds. Your translation, if you're reading along, it might say deeds. Okay. Wisdom is vindicated by all her children. You know what's interesting in this, this statement is that this statement, if you kind of know the scriptures that Jesus would have known and studied and, and met, had memorized, <clears throat> there's one place, prominent place in scripture where wisdom is personified as a woman, which is actually what Jesus said here. He said, yet wisdom is vindicated by all her children. There's one place in scripture where wisdom is referred to as a woman. It's in Proverbs chapter 8. And it's compared to a woman. And it actually says this about this woman. We can throw it up on the screen in Proverbs chapter 8 there. If, we, if you have it, that'd be great. Um, it personifies wisdom as a woman. And the woman's saying this. This is her words in the poem. The Lord acquired me at the beginning of his creation before his works of long ago. I was formed before ancient times. From the beginning, before the earth began. Go to the next one. I was born when there were no watery depths and no springs filled with water. Before the mountains were established, prior to the hills, I was given birth. Before he made the land, the fields, or the first soil on earth, I was there when he established the heavens, when he laid out the horizon, when all of creation was taking place. You see this language? Wisdom, this woman, says, I was there when he placed the skies above, when he, the fountains of the ocean gushed out, and when he set a limit for the sea, so that the waters would not violate his command when he laid out the foundations of the earth. I was a skilled craftsman beside him. I was his delight every day, always rejoicing with him. The Apostle John in John 1 would make a statement about Jesus, and he would use this word called the word, which would, in Greek, in that language he was writing in, was this idea of the divine wisdom of God. And he says, these words, he says, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. He was with God in the beginning. By him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. Do you see the, what he's doing? John is saying that divine wisdom, the word, is Jesus. That Jesus is the wisdom of God revealed to humankind. It says, yet wisdom is vindicated by all her children or her deeds. Now this, whichever way, this, 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 the reason for the translation difference there is because there's two words here that are being used. Um, and I'm not a Greek scholar. The words are ergon and, and um, teklon. And it's, it's kind of a funny, just they, translators are essentially not sure which one it is. But here's what I do know. Here's what I do know. Whether you translate this children or you translate it deeds or work, that word deeds is actually connected to, and the Greek is connected to this idea of a building, of something that a craftsman creates. And here's what I know that scriptures say, the New Testament says that Paul writes, and he says that you are God's workmanship. And so whether you translate this as deeds, as a, as a work of art, or as a building, or whether you translate it as children, this is what I see in this scripture here, is that actually... Yet Jesus is shown to be right, is shown to be the way, the truth, and the life by all his workmanship, by his people, however you call it. It sounds a lot to me like John chapter 15. Excuse me, John chapter 13, verse 35, where he said, all the world will know that I am who I say I am, that I am the way, the truth, and life. All the world will know that you are my disciples if you do what? If you love one another. And this is the final important piece of fasting and feasting is that fasting actually prepares me to enter into the community that I'm supposed to feast in. Fasting is the humility. It's me humbling myself and hearing from God so that I can obey so that then I can actually step into the kingdom and participate in the foretaste of what's coming. And my feasting now is supposed to be a declaration of who God is. We don't have time to get into the end of the scripture, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and 11, Paul is addressing a group of people in, a, in Corinth, and he talks about the Lord's Supper. 
And he says this, he says, listen, you're not actually celebrating the Lord's Supper when you come together. This is what I received from God. That Jesus, on his last moments here, said that my body is like bread. That man doesn't live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And Jesus said, I am the word that came from the mouth of God. I am the word that is God. My my body is real bread and my blood is real drink. And what he was saying is, is that just like you survive on every word that comes from the mouth of God, your ability to thrive and your ability to live in the new kingdom is dependent upon my sacrifice of my body being broken and my blood being spilled out for you. And Paul makes a comment in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. He says, listen, when you come together, the church had at that point realized that actually like this, this supper, this coming together, wasn't just like one time a year in the, in the festival that Jesus had done it, but actually every time they gathered, they believed when they ate and drank together, they were actually celebrating the Lord's Supper. They were celebrating the body and the blood of Jesus. But when they were coming together, they were coming together divided. And he says, listen, I wish I could like, I wish I could say that you're doing a great job of following Jesus, but I can't say that because when you come together, you're divided. You're with these people and you're with these people and you have this opinion and those people have those opinions and they said stuff about you and they, you said stuff about their mom and, and all this stuff, right? And he says, when you come together, it's not actually the Lord's Supper you're eating. In fact, he said, some of you, like you get there, like some of you who are white collar workers, you don't have the same schedule. And so you get to the place where you're going to meet to celebrate and, and feast together. You get there early and you can't wait for the shift workers who are getting paid less and are working long hours and have to work long hours. And so they show up, you're getting together at three, four o'clock at happy hours, start drinking and eating. And, and he says, the shift workers roll in at seven and you've already eaten all the food. And you are not living with an awareness of the body that you have been placed inside. When you talk and when you divide God's church, you're not living with an awareness of, of the body and the community you've been placed inside. And when you go ahead and you just do what you want, you take what you want first because you're hungry and you don't think about the community around you, you are actually doing the opposite. You're turning the Lord's Supper, you're turning the feasting into something it was never meant to be. You're stepping outside of it. When actually your fasting was to humble you so you would realize that you're part of something bigger than yourself. So you could hear and obey. So that your feasting could then be a declaration of the unity and the joy of God's kingdom come. So that whatever you do, and he says this in, in chapter 10, verse 31, whatever, so whether you eat or whether you drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. And he says, and don't be a stumbling block to the Jew in your midst, to the Greek in your midst, to the exile, because I tried to please all people and everything so that I might save as many as possible. This is my thought for us today. In a moment, we're going to receive communion together and we're going to actually feast together and declare God's goodness. But can I just leave you with this? Can I take Paul's words and maybe change a little bit and say, so whatever you do, whether you're feasting or fasting, eating, drinking, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Bye loving one another by protecting one another by honoring each other with our words and our attitudes so that when we come together it truly is the Lord's Supper Paul makes some remarks there where he says listen it's not actually like the Lord's Supper when you come together and when you do all these things he says each one should examine themselves to make sure that you are regarding God's body. And we've kind of taken that to mean that like you should examine yourself to see if you're, if you've sinned at all this last week. And if you've sinned, you can't take communion. <laughs> it's not so. In the context, Paul is saying you should examine yourself to make sure that you are operating in humility as a part of the body. And you haven't separated yourself because of your opinion, because of a conflict, or because you're seeking your own good and not the good of the body. So here's what we're going to do. The band's coming right now. And here's what I would like us to do. We're going to partake of communion together. We're going to do it a little bit differently. The band's going to lead us in a song, and I want us to stay seated. And I want us to take a moment to just examine our hearts. Some of us in this place, we're realizing that I need to start fasting. Because the fasting humbles me and actually puts me in a position where I can be, start feasting and to have that discipline of knowing what it means when my community comes together to take of Jesus' body and blood and become a part of it. 
and it transforms even your normal meal times. You're getting together with friends. How amazing would it be if when we get together as friends and family to eat, come over to people's houses, out to grill, that we approach that meal time not as just we're going to fill ourselves with food and have a great time talking and hanging out, but we're going to actually remember why it is that we come together in the first place. And that becomes actually the very table and supper of the Lord. It's a declaration to the world watching that we belong to him. And wisdom is vindicated by the house that she builds. The truth is shown to be accurate and true, not because it was a great argument, but because we loved one another. All the world will know that I'm the way, the truth, and the life. All the world will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. We're going to take together a couple instructions. Um, these are like brand new, very cool. Um, it's not styrofoam bread anymore. Praise the Lord. The old is gone. The new has come. Um, be careful when we take the bread, we're going to take off the top. Make sure you don't take off the bottom because that will pour grape juice all over your lap. Then flip it over to take off the top. Does that make sense? It's kind of cool. We're going to take a moment to, to partake in communion together. We serve in open communion, which means that if you're a follower of Jesus, we encourage you to, to participate. And if you are not a follower of Jesus, but you're realizing that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life this morning, and you're saying, I need to follow him and I want to respond to him, then this act of taking communion could actually be your entry, your your first moment of participating with the family of Jesus and you've become a part of the family. So I'm going to encourage you to go ahead, if that's you, to partake in communion with us this morning. As the band plays, any point that you feel ready, I want you to go ahead and I want you to talk to the Lord. I want you to respond by taking the bread and taking the cup. I'm not going to lead it. It's going to be a moment for you to reflect and to do it where you're at. Some of us are saying we need to learn how to fast so that we can learn how to feast. If you want a really great resource for that, um, Richard Foster's book, The Celebration of Discipline, gives some really practical disciplines for learning how to fast for the average person. It's amazing, okay? So look that up. The Celebration of Discipline, Richard Foster. Maybe that is the way that you need to respond. Maybe you're saying I need to actually like work out some things with some people in my life. I need to maybe repent, and so fasting would be a great way to even step into that as well. Or maybe it's just I need to say yes to Jesus, so I'm going to become a part of him and his family as I partake in the feasting at the table of the Lord. Amen. Let's reflect and let's pray. And let's respond by taking communion as the band leads us.